Matthew chapter 18, let's begin at verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? God, we pray tonight that you will guide us according to the knowledge of your word and your power by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. All right, fourth question. Fourth question. Disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, let's, let's just back up for a moment. It says, at that time, verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus and asked. Everybody say, at that time. At that time. Well, the phrase, at that time, is important to understand because it doesn't just mean like, you know, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's talking about a season of action and activity, of revelation, when things are happening. The transfiguration has just occurred. Miracles are occurring. Miracles uh, that are miracles of healing, miracles that are strange when he tells Peter, go and go to the lake and, and, and there's a fish there and you'll find the temple tax in the fish's mouth. Go get it. And there it was. So you've got all kinds of manifestations of the power of Jesus and the divinity of Christ in operation. So what is going on is that the disciples now are seeing the kingdom that Jesus has been preaching about. They're seeing it in action. They're seeing it in operation. They're going, hey, this guy can do anything. This really is the Messiah. This really is the Son of God. So he really is going to establish a kingdom. And we're going to be a part of it. Gospel of Mark tells us that same scenario, same incident, a parallel scripture. Gospel of Mark says that, that while they were walking, that they were discussing who would be greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus heard them. Matthew just cuts to the chase. Remember, he's, he's a tax collector. He's all about it, the money. He's just all about the Benjamins. All right, let's just forget the peripheral stuff. Let's cut to the chase. And so Matthew reports and he, he, he records for us then that it is at that time, at that strategic time, that the disciples then ask this question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we know that you're going to establish a kingdom down here on earth. We know heaven is going to come to earth. And we want to know who's going to be large and in charge. We want to understand our function in this thing. What's in it for me? When they said, who is the greatest in the kingdom, that word greatest there is the word in Greek that means more important. Who's more important? Is Peter more important than me? Is John more important than me? Is Nathaniel more important than me? Or am I the most important of all? Each one, of course, thought that they were the most important. We we, we have a sense of empowerment and entitlement about ourselves sometimes. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so he called, it says, verse 2, he called a little child and had him stand or appear among them and he said I tell you the truth now you already know that when he says I tell you the truth there's only one thing that can follow it the truth I tell you the truth unless you change and become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven therefore whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change. Everybody say change. change. We're changed there. It means to turn around. Turn around in your mind. Turn around in your thinking. Turn around in your understanding. Turn around in your posture. Turn around in your attitude. Unless you change and become or come to be like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven you'll never watch this 
you'll never take your place that is set aside for you. Does not mean, listen, it doesn't mean they weren't already saved. It doesn't mean that their names weren't already written down. It doesn't mean that they had to earn their way into the kingdom of heaven. No, he was saying there's a place reserved for you, and your place that's reserved for you will be achieved by a change in your attitude. Because unless you get there, you'll never live ben- you, you will always live beneath the privilege that I anticipated and planned for you. A lot of people miss this. And they misinterpret. And so he says, Therefore, whoever humbles himself or lowers himself in his own thinking, like this child, is then the greatest in the kingdom of heaven or that word greatest then when we find it in verse in the verse means this largest in influence in other words jesus is saying when i release this thing when i establish this thing once i'm gone and this thing comes the kingdom comes by the power of my spirit and I establish my church there's going to be roles and functions and responsibilities for every single one of you I've already got them earmarked but what's going to get you into that place of service and that place of greatness is your attitude A lot of people never step in to what God has for them because their attitude won't allow them to. Doesn't mean that God didn't have something for you. Doesn't mean that God didn't have something planned. Didn't mean, doesn't mean that there wasn't a position or a place of service designed for you. It simply means that one thing or another prevented you from getting into that place that He planned. Jesus then is dealing with this subject matter and he deals with their question and he compares them to children. Now he makes this comparison and he says, unless you become like or come to be like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why does he deal with children? Well, let's, let's, let's answer that question. He makes this comparison then between the disciples, and children. Not because children are supposed to be innocent. Because we all know that children at times can be anything but innocent. He wasn't saying be innocent, be perfect little angels, and then you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll find your place of greatness. No. He wasn't talking about innocence, but He was saying this, because children are dependent on others. Because children have to willingly accept from somebody else what they cannot provide for themselves. That's what I'm telling you, you need to be like. You need to come to a place where you change your thinking about who you are. And understand that you can't be everything you think you are because you can be it. It's not about self-sufficiency. It's not about pulling yourself up by, by your own bootstraps. It's the realization and the recognition that there are certain things you can't do. That there are some things that you can only depend upon God for. And it's that utter dependency, it's that attitude of dependency and reliance upon God uh, that Jesus is telling them they need to have. Children were the most disenfranchised members of ancient society. They had no social standing, they had no, no status whatsoever, none. The only thing that they had was love. That's the only thing that was afforded them. That's what, that was their rank and privilege, was the fact that they were loved. And so, Jesus moves into this usage of a child to illustrate the point. 
Children were totally and completely dependent upon their parents. Let a little child out into the street at two years old, two and a half years old, and, and, and tell him to go fend for himself. What would happen? Starve, destruction, danger, all manner of evil could happen to that little child. So they're dependent then upon parents. Jesus saying, you need to understand that you must be dependent on your heavenly father. You have to get an attitude of dependency. You have to become like a child in your understanding of who you are and who God your father is. And he says, unless you change, say change. Change Change refers to a spiritual act of faith. Unless I move myself in the direction and in the dimension of operating in faith, trusting God, depending on God. It's a spiritual activity. It's not mental. It's not psychological. It's spiritual. It's the attitude of my heart that says, I'm going to depend on God. God is my source. I have nobody else but God. Oh, but if I got God, I don't need nobody else. It's the idea of understanding how to operate in the act of faith. He says, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom. Therefore, verse 4, whoever humbles himself, say humbles. He says, like this little child. Humbling oneself, listen to me, humbling oneself is the transition from pride to the acknowledgement of your utter need to know God and depend on His favor. You move from an exalted position in your own view and estimation, and you lower yourself, and you begin to recognize, and you begin to acknowledge And you begin to understand and make it clear in your own mind and heart that you've got to go from pride to acknowledgement. You've got to go from pride to saying, I am utterly dependent on God. I need Him. Uh, The songwriter said, oh, I need Him like I've never needed somebody before. That's humility. Humility is not a, 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 a lack of acknowledgement of your own traits or your own, or your own character or the things that are good about you. That's not what humility is. Humility is not, well, I'm just no good and I'm nothing and, you know, praise God. No, that's not humility. That's false humility because most people who say that stuff think they're all that in a bag of chips anyway. No, humility is... I need him. I need him to live. I need him to survive. I need him to prosper. I I, I need God in my life in order to go from day to day. I need God in my life in order to go from here to there. I can't make it without him. I can't go one day without. I need God in my life. So humility then is the Transition from pride to the acknowledgement of an utter need to know God and depend on His favor. I have to know Him. Uh, I have to know Him. I got to know Him. Paul said, I got to know you. Ah, hallelujah. Because everything else I knew got me nowhere. Paul said all the knowledge and all the understanding and all the titles and the degrees and all the accolades and all the religious acknowledgments of who I am. And I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I studied under Gamaliel, the greatest teacher in the world at the known, in that known time. I, all of that is dung. It's manure. There's only one thing I need. I need to know you. And the fellowship of your suffering and the power of the resurrection. I need to know you. 
You've got to get to that place where you have this utter need to know God and you depend on His favor. If I don't have your favor, I got nothing. If I don't have your favor, I'm subject to man's edict over my life. If I don't have your favor, then I'm subject to luck and chance, fortune. But if I got your favor, your favor opens doors. Your favor clears the way. Your favor protects me. Your favor blesses me. Your favor moves in my behalf. I need you, God. Jesus said, you got to be like a child. Children know what they need. Children know who they need. When a child needs somebody, they don't go to, 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 to auntie. They go to mama. I need you, mama. I, I, I never forget. I was, I was thinking about this the other day when, when I would come home uh, years and years ago, of course, many. <laughs> and I'd come home from work uh, when I was working secular. And, 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 and my children would run through the hallway of the apartment we lived in. And they'd go, Daddy. And they'd come running and grab me. And I'd pick them up. Why? They needed me. They needed me at that moment. And I knew what to impart to them. God knows what you need. He knows what to impart to you. He knows what to give you. And the place that moves you then into your place in the kingdom is the acknowledgement of your need of Him. My kids knew their place. I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I mean this. I mean they knew that they were my children and I was their father. They knew they could count on me and depend on me for anything they needed in their life. And I'd get it. I don't care what I had to do. I'd get it. That utter dependency on God is what Jesus is talking about when it comes to humility. He says, you've got to change and you've got to humble yourself. Two things. And so, in order to step into greatness in the kingdom, status in God's kingdom, listen, depends on willingness to trust Him regardless of the circumstances. Willingness to trust Him regardless of the circumstances. It is that humbling of oneself, trusting God, depending on the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God, the wisdom of God, the plan of God, the character of God, that moves you into a place of greatness. It's, I trust you no matter what. The more you're able to trust God, the more God is able to move you into a place of service and blessing. Humility, then, involves submission to divine authority as a necessity for greatness into the kingdom. Now, well, where do we find that? Well, it's interesting because let's, let's look at this for just a moment. Look at verse 2. The disciples ask the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus begins with an action. He doesn't answer them right away. But he says, it says, and he called a little child and had him stand among them. The word called there means sent for him. He calls a little child and has him stand or appear within their midst. Now understand this. It doesn't say that Jesus knew who that kid was or that kid knew who Jesus was. But there was an acknowledgement of authority. The master is calling for you. The master is demanding your presence. And so go to where he is. And so the child moves in conjunction with the order. 
He doesn't say no. He doesn't say, I've got something better to do. He doesn't say, I'm busy. I'm playing uh, jacks. I'm playing tiddlywinks. I'm on my computer. I've got my, I got my phone. I'm on, I'm on chat. I'm not, no, no, the child says, okay, where is he? Where, where does he want me? Where does he want me? Stand right here, right here among these guys. Okay, I'm here. So submission to authority is essential for greatness in the kingdom. That statement then makes the point that the child willingly responded to Jesus' instruction. There's one thing to be coerced into something. There's one thing to be manipulated into something. There is one thing to be uh, uh, ordered against your will. And you have to do it and you're not happy about it. But this child willingly moves. Your willingness is the key evidence of your humility. Your willingness is the key observable action of your humility because humility says I'll go where you want me to go I'll do what you want me to do I'll say what you want me to say I'll be in the place you want me to be it's not about what I want it's about what you say it's not about my will it's your will it's not about my predilection or my preference or my prerogative it's about your plan and your purpose in my life whatever you say that's the evidence of your humility kingdom status also recognizes divine purpose when you recognize that God has a plan and he has a purpose. And you are willing to move in it. And to submit to it. And to acquiesce to it. God says, there's a willing heart. There's a humble heart. There's a heart I can use. That's a life that will serve me. And I don't have to coerce them. And I don't have to beg them. And I don't have to threaten them. And I don't have to manipulate them. All I have to do is ask them to come. All I have to do is give them an instruction. And so you recognize then this principle of God saying, this is what I want you to do, and you willingly move into it. Kingdom status is achieved by your willingness to respond to the call of God on your life. The disciples had become so preoccupied with the organization of an earthly kingdom. The Bible says that James and John, the sons of thunder, they came to Jesus along with their mama. Uh, look, when we come into your kingdom, y- yes, yeah, when, when, when my sons come into your kingdom, my boys here, little Jamie and little Johnny, little Jimmy, when, 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 when you set this thing up, I want them right up in there. One on your left, one on your right. Vice President and Grand Vizier. That, that's what I want, right here. Vice President, Secretary of State. All right, good. That's settled. And Peter's like, say what? I'm the one with the mouth. I'm bold. Y'all are nothing. They're all arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And they become so preoccupied with the organization of an earthly kingdom that they lost sight of kingdom priorities. Instead of seeking the places of humble servitude. No, I don't need to be first. I don't need to be on your right or your left. I'll I'll take fifth spot. It, It don't matter. Put me where you want. Instead of seeking the places of humble servitude, they sought positions of prestige and rank and privilege. You see, greatness is the result of living your life under kingdom authority. 
where your present conduct and attitude is reflective of kingdom concerns and eternal realities. In other words, what's really important to you? What's really important to you? Where are your priorities lining up? What is of value to you? Jesus is saying, when you get to a place where kingdom priorities and eternal realities are number one and two on your list, then you have walked into greatness. Listen, the main characteristic of Christian greatness is not ability, but humility. It's not self-sufficiency, but it's true, genuine spirituality. Say amen. Amen. You can be great in the kingdom. You can be great in the kingdom. I just told you how. If you're willing to do it, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say glory to God. Stand to your feet. Give God some praise. God, we truly desire to be great in your kingdom. Not great in our own eyes. Not great in the estimation of man. Not receiving the accolades of the world. But simply to stay and move into the place that you've designed us for. The position of functionality. Kingdom priorities. Eternal realities things that are important to you. That's our heart. That's our desire. That's what we really really do want, God. In the depth of every heart is a desire to be great in your eyes and to serve your purposes and to serve your kingdom. So we commit ourselves to that tonight by the power of your Spirit, moving in our hearts, operating in our hearts, working according to your divine plan and your divine power. And we give you the praise for it because you will Bring it to pass. We give you glory. Now bless your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.